three, two, one. It is started. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here with us. And today is going to be the last seminar of the season. It is my pleasure to introduce the uh, the same nice speaker today, Dr. Teja Shidwar. Teja has been a postdoc in my lab for the last two years in a um, collaborative project I have with uh, Nubia. We got the Magnetic Grant a while back. And um, so Teja is studying um, plant viruses and how to control plant viruses using agricultural systems. And she's combined nanotechnology and um, plant viruses and molecular biology to see if you can accomplish the task. And with that, I'll let uh, Teja take from here. OK, thank you so much, Washington, for the introduction. Hello, all. Thank you for uh, tuning into my talk. Today, I'll be talking about nano-enabled delivery of RNA molecules for tackling plant viruses. So the basic question is, why do we do it that we are doing? The reason is the virus disease management strategies that are in practice currently are quite inefficient. Viruses are the second most destructive group of plant pathogens after fungi, and they lead to tremendous yield and economic losses. There is absence of effective virucides for direct control. Now, there are some natural resistant genes present in plants, however, there's constant emergence of new strains, and these new recombinant strains can now infect the plants which were previously resistant to the parental strain. There are options like using transgenic plants or GMO, GMOs. However, people's perception about using GMOs is quite negative. So basically, there is a lack of efficient and publicly acceptable disease management strategy. And with the current uh, increase in the global food demand, there's an urgent need that such a strategy is developed. So scientists thought, why not make use of RNAi or RNA interference, which is a natural cellular host defense mechanism which takes place in eukaryotic cells, be it plants or animals, when they are under virus attack. So what happens under natural conditions is when the virus attacks, double-stranded RNA or dsRNA is formed due to regular genome replication of the virus, or hairpin-like structure can be formed due to sequence complementarity within the genome. When the plant realizes that it is under, when the plant realizes that there is this virus derived dsRNA or hairpin RNA, it is alarmed that it is under virus attack. So it recruits an enzyme called as dicer, which goes and targets or dices the double stranded RNA or the hairpin RNA, and siRNA or small inhibitory RNA is formed. This siRNA is typically 21 to 26 nucleotide in length. Then more proteins from the host come and bind to the siRNA, of which AGO or argonaut is the most important protein. Now these proteins and siRNA form a complex which is called as RISC or RNA-induced silencing complex. When this complex is formed, one of the strands of the siRNA is cleaved off and the remaining strand of siRNA actually acts as a guide strand which guides this risk complex to go and bind to an RNA which is complementary to the guide RNA. Now this guide RNA is derived from the virus so naturally the complementary RNA would be the viral RNA which would be present in the cell as it is under virus attack. So this guide RNA guides the risk complex to go and bind to the virus RNA that is present in the cell and the virus RNA is then degraded. This is how the plants try to prohibit viral RNA replication and thereby proliferation. To enhance this RNAi mechanism, 
transgenic plants are used wherein constructs that lead to synthesis of dsrna are integrated into the genome of the plant so that dsrna is continuously generated and the plant is always primed or prepared for a virus attack there are several advantages of using transgenic plants one is it is effective secondly it provides prolonged protection against the virus however it also has many disadvantages firstly generating transgenic plants is labor and cost intensive secondly use of transgenic plants or gmos is highly regulated and the third and the most important disadvantage is negative perception of people about using gmos so what is an alternative to this an alternative is exogenous application of dsrna so dsrna is synthesized in the lab then it is topically applied to the plant the dsrna enters the plant it triggers the rnai machinery and it primes or prepares the plant for the virus attack so it, as soon as the virus attacks the plant it can get rid of the virus this technique offers several advantages firstly it is non gmo so whatever dsrna that is topically being applied it does not integrate into the genome of the plant so this is non gmo secondly it is quite easy to synthesize dsrna in the lab and thirdly this method is effective topical application of dsrna does provide protection against the virus however the disadvantage of topical application of dsrna is the short term protection provided by this method i am going to talk more in detail about this disadvantage a bit later in my talk coming to the virus that i'm working with i'm working with potato virus y or pvy which is a deadly pathogen of potato but along with potato it can also infect other crops such as tomato eggplant bell pepper tomato or tobacco and so on in this study i am working with tobacco as the host uh, i forgot to mention one thing the symptoms developed on pvy infection depend on the strain of pvy and also the variety of the host so as you can see in the picture infection with pvy can either cause necrosis or simple mosaic like pattern so i am working with tobacco as a host in this project there are two reasons for that first pvy is a huge threat to the tobacco or the cigar industry even a single blemish on the tobacco leaf is not acceptable for rolling cigars and you can see here very clearly what pvy can do to tobacco plants the second and the more important reason is tobacco is a model plant it is easy to grow tobacco it's easy to carry out experiments with tobacco and the research that i am doing is transferable so whatever results that we have can later be used for other crops for example potato and that's what the plan is a brief background about the genome of pvy pvy is a positive sense single stranded rna virus which means the core genetic material is not dna but rna on expression a single polypeptide is formed which is then cleaved into 10 mature proteins by the proteases and each protein has a distinct function like any other virus pvy cannot survive on its own it requires the host machinery for replication and proliferation there are several strains of pvy and for my study i'll be focusing on a strain called m vilga which is creating havoc in united states now i want to synthesize dsrna in the lab for that i synthesize it in vitro using a kit or in vivo where i synthesize dsrna in bacterial cells but for synthesis of dsrna in the lab i need to identify a region from the genome of pvy 
that would be ideal to use as a template for my dsRNA synthesis in the lab. What I mean is the PVY genome is 9.7 KB in size. And studies show that for topical application of dsRNA, the ideal size is just 500 to 600 base pairs. Now the question is, which 500 to 600 base pair regions should I choose from this 9.7 KB genome of PVY, a region that would be ideal as a template for my dsRNA synthesis and dsRNA from that region will be efficacious in providing antiviral control. How do we choose that region? We thought, why not identify that region which is highly targeted by RNAi during natural infection of tobacco by PVY, which means when tobacco is infected by PVY, that region of PVY is heavily targeted by the dicer. A lot of siRNAs are generated. Maybe that is the region that is heavily targeted. And if I use that region as a template, for synthesis of my dsRNA, maybe it would provide an efficacious control. So one way to find out which G region of PVY is heavily targeted by RNAi is doing siRNA sequencing. So just to remind you, when a virus attacks a cell, double-stranded RNA is formed or hairpin-like structure is formed, which is diced or targeted by the dicer and small RNAs or siRNAs are formed and we are sequencing these siRNAs to find out from which region of the genome have they originated. So basically tobacco plants were infected with PVY strain vilga. Small RNA was isolated and subjected to sequencing. Once I had the siRNA sequences, I knew the sequence of my siRNAs. I already know the sequence of my genome. So I can map these siRNAs against my genome to firstly confirm that it is the siRNAs are derived from the virus. And secondly, to identify from which region are the siRNAs generated. So just to give you an example, once I have my siRNA sequencing data and I map the siRNAs and I found out, find, find out that some siRNAs are derived from the VPG region. I also find out that there are many siRNAs that have been derived from the HC Pro region, suggesting that HC Pro region is probably heavily targeted during natural infection. And if I use 500 to 600 bases from the HC Pro region, region as a template for my dsRNA synthesis, then this, this dsRNA would be more efficacious as compared to dsRNA synthesized from a region that is not heavily targeted during RNAi. So this is the result of mapping of my siRNA against the genome of PVY. You can see three graphs here because three independent plants were infected with PVY and RNA was isolated and then subjected to sequencing. Blue siRNAs are the siRNAs derived from the sense strand and red siRNAs are the siRNAs derived from the anti-sense strand as siRNA is a duplex. From this study, I found out that there is one region where from HC Pro uh, from the PVY genome, that is the HC Pro region, where large number of siRNAs were generated. So probably this region was heavily targeted during natural infection by I RNAi. And if I use this region as a template for my dsRNA synthesis, it might be quite efficacious in providing antiviral control. I just want to mention something here that this VSIR, VSI RNA profiling study that we did, one reason was to identify a region from the genome which is heavily targeted. But such studies are quite important because they give a lot of information regarding the RNAi machinery. Our study revealed that 
such VSIRNA profiles that are generated are specific to a virus host combination contrary to what has been published before that these SIRNA profiles are only dependent on the virus. This research was very important and such research do help in um, developing better disease management strategies. Coming back to choosing the ideal genomic region as a template for DSRNA synthesis. So as I just explained, I chose a 500 to 600 base pair region from, from HC Pro Cistron of PVY as the SRNA sequencing analysis revealed that this was probably heavily targeted by RNAi as a large number of siRNAs were generated from that region. But there should always be a plan B. We feel that if we use dsRNA from this region, it would be highly effic efficacious, but this is just an hypothesis. So as an alternative, I chose another region, a 500 to 600 base pair region from the Cistron NIB of PVY. The reason is a previous study had shown that dsRNA from the NIB region provided greater protection against PVY when topically applied as compared to other regions analyzed in that study. Now that study did not do any high throughput sequencing analysis. They just chose random regions, use those as templates for dsRNA synthesis, and they found out out of all those regions, dsRNA synthesized from the NIB region was most efficacious amongst those regions. So I decided to include NIB in my analysis. Another study showed that transgenic plants expressing CP provided 100% protection. So I wanted to check if dsRNA from the CP region is topically applied, is it able to protect the plant from virus infection? So now I know from which region I have to synthesize my dsRNAs. I synthesize dsRNA in the lab. I have my dsRNA. The next thing I want to check is the dsRNA that I'm topically applying to the plant. Is it systemically transported or it just stays on the leaf where I'm applying it? because I want the entire plant to be protected. So the dsRNA needs to be systemically transported throughout the plant. So for checking that, what I did is I applied dsRNA to a leaf designated as L, and then I tried to detect dsRNA in a systemic leaf or a newer leaf, which was one whorl on top. So after application of DSR, dsRNA, I collected leaf disks from the local and systemic leaf. I extracted RNA and did RT-PCR to detect my dsRNA. And this is what I found. One, two, three are the three different plants that I used for application of dsRNA. The experiment was performed in triplicates. And as you can see here, DSRNA could be detected in the local as well as systemic leaf, suggesting that DSRNA is systemically transported in the plant. However, when I tried to detect DSRNA at the later stages, say 9 or 12 days post application of DSRNA, I was not able to detect any DSRNA. The reason could be that whatever DSRNA that I'm topically applying it is used up by the RNAi machinery once it enters the cell, or it is degraded by the nucleases that are present inside the plant cell. So basically, this result showed me that topically applied dsRNA is systemically transported, but it seems to be degraded over time. The next thing that I wanted to check is that the, is the dsRNA that I'm topically applying is that inducing RNAi? Is that triggering RNAi? Only then will the plant be prepared or primed for a virus attack. And one way to check if RNAi is being induced on topical application of dsRNA is detecting the siRNAs. 
I did the same thing as I mentioned before. I applied DSRNA to local leaves and I collected leaf discs from local and systemic leaf, extracted RNA, and then I did RT PCR just to detect this uh, siRNA. I would like to mention here that a regular RT PCR does not work. siRNA is just 21 to 26 nucleotide in length. And for those who regularly do PCRs know that amplification would be impossible with primers where primers itself are nearly 20 to 21 nucleotide in length. So a special kind of RT-PCR needs to be done, which is called stem loop RT-PCR. Special primers need to be designed for that. I'm not going in details of how I, how I did it, but if anyone is interested, I can talk about that after the presentation. So when I tried to detect my siRNA, I was able to detect siRNA in local as well as systemic leaves, suggesting that whatever dsRNA I'm topically applying is triggering RNAi and siRNAs are being generated in the plant. So yes, topically applied dsRNA can trigger RNAi. Now coming to the actual bioassays to determine the antiviral efficacy of the dsRNAs that I'm applying. So I applied dsRNA to the plant, dsRNA derived either from the HC Pro region or NIV region or the CP region. For each experiment, I use the same amount of dsRNA. Then I inoculated with the virus one or five days post dsRNA application. And then two to three weeks after virus inoculation, I tried to evaluate or assess the symptoms produced. It's very easy to assess these symptoms. The leaf here is a leaf from an uninfected plant and the leaf where you see symptoms are from an infected plant. And this is what I observed. When I inoculated with the virus, just one day after dsRNA treatment, there was a drastic reduction in the number of infected plants where the plants were pre-treated with the dsRNA as compared to a mop control where instead of the dsRNA, I just applied water. This showed that topically applied dsRNA does protect the plant against PBY. So that was a good news. However, when I inoculated with the virus five days after dsRNA treatment, this is what I saw. The number of infected plants had increased or in short, the efficacy of the dsRNA treatment had reduced when I inoculated with the virus five days after dsRNA treatment. One take home message from this experiment was that probably HCPRO is the most ideal region for synthesis of dsRNA because it is most efficacious in providing antiviral control. But the bigger problem here is dsRNA of treatment provides a short term of protection, just three to four days. And as we saw before, the reason could be that the dsRNA that I'm applying is quickly degraded either by the nucleases uh, that are present inside the plant cell or even conditions uh, in the environment. So what is the solution to this problem? How can we prolong this protection window provided by topical application of dsRNA? And the solution is nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are particles which are very small in size. The size range is typically 1 to 100 nanometers, at least in one dimension. A wide range of nanoparticles are used in the medical field as well as agricultural sector. Pioneering work is done here at the station itself on role of nanoparticles in plant disease management or plant growth promotion. However, here we are looking at nanoparticles as nucleic acid carriers or nucleic acid delivery agents. Why? Because studies show that binding of the nanoparticle to the dsRNA protects the dsRNA from degradation by enzymes or it provides more stability to the nucleic acid. Secondly, 
binding to the nanoparticles can allow a more sustained or slow release of the dsrna into the plant which can help prolong the protection window provided by the dsrna the nanoparticles that i am working on first are kytosan based nanoparticles why kytosan because it is natural it is biodegradable and it is always good if you can work on something which is not toxic so i synthesized kytosan nanoparticles kytosan is intrinsically positively charged so it can bind to your dsrna which is negatively charged and a kytosan dsrna polyplex or complex can be formed i am also working with kytosan ppp nanoparticles where kytosan is cross linked with tripolyphosphate and studies suggest suggests that this cross linking provides more stability to the kytosan nanoparticle again the negatively charged kytosan tpp nanoparticles can be complexed with positively charged kytosan tpp nanoparticles can be complexed with negative negatively charged dsrna to form a kytosan tpp dsrna complex now i characterized my nanoparticles using dls dynamic light scattering or tem and tem this is the tem image of my kytosan tpp dsrna complex unfortunately i am not able to get a good tem image of my kytosan nanoparticles they seem to be quite unstable i need to repeat un i need to repeat that again for a better picture now particularly positively charged kytosan nanoparticles bind to negatively charged dsrna to form a complex but how do i confirm that such a complex is formed for that simple agarose gel electrophoresis was done agarose gel electrophoresis is routinely done for separation of nucleic acid and their detection after staining so this is an image of an agarose gel it is a gel matrix made of agarose samples are loaded in the wells that you can see here and electric charge is applied from negative to positive and as the nucleic acid is negatively charged it runs through the gel and then you can stain it with a dye which is specific for nucleic acids and you can detect it so when i applied naked when i use naked dsrna you can see that it runs through the gel however when i apply dsrna kytosan complex it is not negatively charged anymore so it is just stuck in the well and you can detect it because of the dsrna present in the complex i also use kytosan just as a control thankfully uh, nothing can be seen the dye is specific for nucleic acid it is not supposed to uh, stain kytosan and that is what i observed i also checked the binding of dsrna to kytosan tpp nanoparticles and as you can see here that complex is also just stuck in the well the dsrna is not negatively charged anymore and that is why it's just stuck there and it confirms that my dsrna is bound to the kytosan or kytosan tpp nanoparticles now i wanted to check the binding efficiency of dsrna to the kytosan nanoparticles or in short try and find out what is the least amount of kytosan that can bind maximum amount of dsrna so for that basically i synthesize kytosan dsrna complex with varying amount of dsrna the complex solution was centrifuge so that the kytosan dsrna complex is actually pelleted and whatever dsrna is unbound stays in the supernatant so i measured the concentration of dsrna from the supernatant now i know how much of dsrna i have put in the beginning i know how much dsrna is unbound or is present in the supernatant so i can exactly calculate how much dsrna was bound to kytosan and my results show that the ideal binding ratio where maximum amount of dsrna was bound to kytosan was 1 is to 1.5 and i would go ahead with this ratio for carrying out my further experiments 
Now I'm also working with silica based nanoparticles. Why silica based nanoparticles? Because silica is bio inert. Secondly, it is easy to functionalize silica nanoparticles so that you can engineer them according to your need. So silica nanoparticles for fun are functionalized so that they are positively charged and your negatively charged DSRNA can then be absorbed to them onto them. We have a collaboration with Dr. Guardado, who's an expert in synthesis of silica based nanoparticles. She has provided detailed protocols for synthesis of these nanoparticles, so I might end up synthesizing these nanoparticles in house. But currently I'm using silica nanoparticles which are commercially available. They are already positively charged. What we also want to try out is these special silica based nanoparticles which would be provided by our collaborator Dr. Hayes from University of Minnesota. So what the idea is that silica nanoparticle will be coated with the material material that undergoes dissolution over time. It would be positively charged so that negatively charged DSRNA can be loaded onto it. And as, as I said, over time, this material will dissolve slowly and it will slowly release DSRNA. And we speculate that this will allow a more controlled release of DSRNA, which can further help prolong the protection window provided by the DSRNA. Just as Kaitosan, I checked if DSRNA is bound to silica, and as you can see here, it is stuck in the wells. I also try to find out the binding efficiency of DSRNA to silica nanoparticles. A similar methodology was used. Varying amount of DSRNA was added to the silica nanoparticle solution. The complex was pelleted by centrifugation and I tried to measure the concentration of DSRNA present in the supernatant in order to calculate the amount of DSRNA that was bound to the silica nanoparticles. And as you can see here, there's not much difference in the percentage of bound DSRNA when I vary the ratios. But as, as I increased the amount of DSRNA more than the ratio one is to five, there was a reduction in the percentage of bound DSRNA. So I thought for the future experiment, one is to four might be an ideal ratio to carry out the experiments. What I'm doing right now is checking the systemic transport of DSRNA. So I have applied silica nanoparticles, DSRNA alone, and silica nanoparticle DSRNA complex to the leaves. Like before, I will collect leaf discs from the local and systemic leaves at regular time intervals, and not just detect, but try and quantify DSRNA that is present in the local and systemic leaves of DSRNA. So what I want to check here is, is there any difference in the amount of DSRNA that I can detect in the systemic leaves when I'm applying naked DSRNA or silica uh, nanoparticle DSRNA complex that will tell me if binding with silica is allowing a more sustained release of DSRNA. I would also check the levels of silica in the local and systemic leaves just to see if the nanoparticles are uh, transported across the plant. It would also be interesting to check silica in the roots. A similar experiment would be performed to check a transport of DSRNA when I'm applying DSRNA chitosan complex. And then the important bioassays where I would combine my DSRNA with the nanoparticle, apply that to the plant, then inoculate with the virus 10 to 20 days post application of DSRNA and see if application of this DSRNA nanoparticle complex is able to prolong the protection window. The PVY symptoms would be evaluated to determine that. Now, apart from DSRNA, what I'm also trying to do is exogenously apply siRNA to check if it induces RNAi mediated protection. 
So just as a reminder till now, I was talking about DSRNA. DSRNA is diced by dicer so that siRNAs are produced and it is the siRNAs which are actually incorporated into the risk complex which goes and cleaves off the viral RNA. So I want to see if I topically apply siRNA, can that protect the plant from the virus? Such studies have never been done before for antiviral disease management. So why um, I want to try this because I think it would be cost effective. siRNAs are small in size, 20 to 26 nucleotide as compared to dsRNAs, which are 500 to 600 base pairs in length. So they're smaller in size, so cheaper to synthesize them. Secondly, when I'm applying my dsRNA, which is 500 to 600 base pairs in length, some region of it is targeted by RNAi, siRNA is generated, which is then incorporated into the wrist to cleave off the viral RNA. But there might be some region in the dsRNA which is of no use. Whereas when I'm applying siRNA, I know from the high throughput sequencing analysis exactly which siRNA is generated during RNAi and if I apply that siRNA topically, probably all that siRNA is used up by the RNAi in order to cleave the viral RNA. What I mean to say that if I'm using 500, uh, 50 microgram of dsRNA, if I topically apply siRNA, I need to use 5 microgram or even less than that, even that would be effective. Second advantage of using siRNA would be easier delivery. siRNA is small in size, so it can be easily enter. It can easily enter the plant and it easily transported throughout the plant. And secondly, it would also open more avenues for using different nanoparticles. As an example, mesoporous silica nanoparticles can be used. These nanoparticles have pores inside them. So because of the small size, siRNA can be attached inside the pores, which probably will provide more protection to the siRNA from the nucleases. So for preliminary experiments, I tried topical application of two siRNAs and I found out that they provided 100% protection against PVY. Again, this, again, this is just a preliminary experiment and I need to repeat the experiment. I would also be interested to see if uh, siRNAs which are a cold spot or less number of siRNAs are generated du during RNAi, if I use that particular siRNA as compared to the hotspot where multiple reads could be detected, is there any difference in efficacy on applications of these hotspot or cold spot siRNAs? So in conclusion, I found that topically applied dsRNA is transported systemically and it triggers RNAi. Second, exogenously applied dsRNA mediated protection against PVY is unfortunately short term. Third, dsRNA derived from the HC pro region seems to be most effective against PVY. And what I'm currently doing or would do in near future is determine if chitosan or silica-based silica nanoparticles significantly prolong the antiviral protection period when used as delivery agents and also investigate if topically applied siRNA can provide antiviral protection and if so, combine them, combine siRNA with nanoparticles and see if this protection window can be prolonged. This method can open so many avenues. So if it works, then we can also use a cocktail of dsRNAs derived from different dsRNAs or siRNAs derived from different viruses, combine them and apply it to the plant to see if the plant is protected from multiple viruses. Not just that, uh, topical application of dsRNA is also used for pest management, uh, fungus control. So it just, this strategy just has a large number of applications. So this is it for now. 
I would like to thank uh, Dr. Da Silva and Dr. Zuber Zamena, my PIs and co-PIs. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. I, and I would be happy to answer your questions. And if there are any suggestions, that would be great too. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Teja, for the nice uh, presentation. So we do have a few questions here. Uh, the first one is, uh, hi Teja, why is your small RNA 60 nucleotides in length when you were assessing RNA I processing of your top complication of double strand RNA? Uh, sorry, can you, why is your siRNA 16? Yeah, I sorry, think you can, can read the question. Yeah, you can also read the question on your screen too if you press the button there. But let me um, let me ask again. Okay. So why is your is more RNA six nucleotide in length when you are assessing RNA AI processing of your top application of double strand RNA? I think they are asking why is sixty uh, if in fact is twenty one, right? The real one you are uh, um, assessing. Yes, it is. Uh, it's usually twenty one to twenty six nucleotide in length. Um, the I think you are talking about. Uh, one image. OK, I can show it. Can you see the? Yeah, you can see that. Okay. So yes, you are um, right. SIRNAs are typically 20 to 26 nucleotide in length, but it is impossible to do a PCR with something that is so small. So we have to use a special stem loop primer in the RT step which actually elongates the length of the uh, amplicon. I can I have a picture I can share with you. Why is it higher in? Why is it 60 base pair and not uh, 21? So this is the siRNA, which is 20, 21 nucleotide typically, and then you use a stem loop primer which can bind to your siRNA and then during the PCR uh, the stem loop is going to open up and then you use specific primers which bind to the siRNA and a region that binds in the uh, uh, reverse the RT primer region. The universal reverse primer binds to uh, a region from the RT primer. So this total length is around 60 base, base pairs. That's why I had written 60 there and this is 21 to 26. Okay, okay essentially so your Target. So you're targeting 21 to 25 nucleotides long. Yes. Uh, your technique um, allows you to determine that and also amplify something that's 60 nucleotides long, right? Right. So you can easily amplify it and visualize it using agar okay. okay, that's good. And also, I think it's good to highlight that without this this technique, the stem loop RT PCR, you cannot. It, actually uh, amplify any small RNA because of right. the site. You said that before, but I think right. and this um, is a nice picture right here to show. Mm -hmm. OK, there is another question. Question number two. Could the short term protection of RNA AI be used strategically for virus control? Is there any step or time window in some crop production system where this might be especially useful? Oh. Um, to so basically, there is always a window where uh, the plant is more susceptible to virus infection. Many, most of these viruses are transmitted to through insect vectors, and uh, even for that, as during the later stages, as the plant grows old, infection is difficult. So there is a window that you need to protect the plant with. Uh, I am quite doubtful if just this four or five uh, days of protection window will be enough for any plant. It it usually needs to be more than that because you have to protect the plant for a range for a certain period of time uh, when it, it is most susceptible. So I think there is a need to prolong the protection window. Just four or five days wouldn't be enough for most of the plants. All right, that's good. Um, so question number three. Could the, could the short term protection of RNAi be used strategically for virus control? Oh, no, that's already did. Yeah. Uh, OK, yeah. it's repeated. 
Okay, there is another one. It's more like a, it's written. It's more like a comment, but I think it's a good point. Why mm -hmm. is more RNAs might be more cost effective if they use you risk virus cape? Um, actually, that is a very good and uh, valid point. Uh, as I mentioned, I feel it would be cost effective because that is what is going to be used, but it will. this technique will be more useful if like a cocktail of siRNAs is used instead of just one sequence so that you know you're making sure that even if there is an escape, you are providing more siRNAs targeting different regions. OK. So you can uh, essentially can combine different small right. RNAs, right? Right, right. OK, so question number four. Hi, Tej. I'm curious. Did you test whether the candidate region highly targeted by RNAi in tobacco is the same as in other hosts? Oh, uh, that basically someone. So we tested in tobacco, right? So there, there is some other group that uh, tested PVY infection in potato and they had done the siRNA profiling analysis and it shows that uh, different regions seem to be targeted because their, their siRNA profile was quite different from us. That's why we feel that this uh, targeting is depends on a specific virus host combination. So with the host, this target will differ. This targeting will differ. OK, so there is a question here and uh, this could be an extremely powerful and unique management strategy. Bravo. I don't know of many papers of any or if there is any in this area. Are there other groups working on unscaled delivery of double strand RNA for triggering RNAi? So there is just one paper till now which has worked used clay nanosheets um, or magnesium aluminium nanoparticles, but those that we are trying to use are th those which can be tuned more according to our needs. So I think that will be more helpful in uh, prolonging the protection window or as I said, tuning it according to our needs. So we have advantages over to what has already been done. There is just one study apart from us. OK. Right, but there, there are other studies also, Teja, for um, RNA um, gene silencing, right? Uh, gene silencing, for yes. For antiviral protection, there is just one study. Use of topical application uh, of plasmids or siRNA combined with nanoparticles that has been done for uh, plant gene silencing. Yes, but for and for anti as an antiviral strategy, there's just one study, and we are not using those nanoparticles. All right, very good. Okay, so I don't see any other question here. If you guys have questions, maybe you can ask. Let me see. There's a new one. Oh. So I missed one question here. I can't really see him. And now I asked the question about the target. Okay. Uh, yeah, all the questions uh, that I see here have already been answered. Um, yeah. All right. If uh, there is no other question, I would like to thank uh, Teja for the nice presentation. And thank you for sharing all those nice uh, results to you. I just want to highlight that Teja didn't talk about everything she did because she didn't have time. So she talked about just the major discoveries. Thank you, Teja. Have a nice one. Thank you so much.